I'm 8-Pack and I'm here to do a quick video about the 4090 GPU by NVIDIA. What we'll be looking at here is the actual GPU itself, including uh, the physical layout and the cooler. Some testing results are both stock and overclocked when compared to previous generations. This time, Bryony has prepared a script and she's here. Hello. So I'm going to follow it. That being said, let's get into it. Okay, so firstly, let's go through the spec of the 4090 GPU, which is codenamed Ada Lovelace. Basically, it's got 24 gig of GDDR6. It's got 128 RT cores, 512 tensor cores, and a massive 16,384 CUDA cores, which is around 60% more than the 3090 was at its launch around 24 months ago. Now we've gone through the quick specs, let's look physically at the cards that I've used here for testing and see how they differ. Here we have uh, the 3080 Ti, here we have the 3090, and here we have the smallest 4090 I could find. What we see here is the largest 3080 Ti, which is the Strix RC, is around three uh, slots in width maximum. The 4090 here, which again, I, he's definitely the smallest one I could find, is three and a half slots in size, so a full slot wider. It's also, if we compare the size here, in length, let's get them fairly well lined up, maybe 10, 10 to 15 mil longer. So a very beefy card. And in terms of weight, uh, all of this is taken up by cooler, so the weight is also much heavier. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Even with the 3090 here. So now let's just check it against the MSI uh, 3090 that I used in my testing. Uh, this is a fairly beefy 3090 as well. Uh, and I would say it's about a slot wider. Uh, this is a three slot design. Uh, versus 3.5, 3.75, and this is probably 20 mil longer. So it's a very, very beefy card with a very, very beefy cooler, uh, and, it, and it weighs a lot more. Also, physically, we can see these cards here have the traditional PCI Express connectors, uh, eight pin connectors, three of them. This has eight pin connectors, three of them. This, however, has eight pin connectors, three of them, but via an adapter, into a new PCI Express uh, version 3 or ATX version 3 uh, connector here. Uh, now we have tested uh, the cards with uh, PSUs of ATX version 3 and uh, with the adapter cable and seen no difference in terms of performance or in terms of power delivery. We've tested the cards with anything with several quality PSUs of 1000 watts and above and again noticed no degradation in performance or any problems with stability. What we would recommend if you're using this 450 watt uh, power output PCB is a minimum of 1000 watts of the old style ATX 2.0 PSU. Or of course, uh, if you can get a brand new ATX uh, 3.0 and then you don't need to use uh, the adapter cable. And if you're gonna uh, buy a card, which at the moment we haven't confirmed any, uh, apart from a couple of Zotac that are 600 watt PCB, uh, they would need a 1200 watt plus P PSU. So another point I will make is that these adapter cables are quite difficult to plug in and the plug is quite flimsy on the card with the pins being actually on the card itself. So I would be careful when you're plugging them into the card. Obviously you don't want to damage the plug uh, or the connector itself. So that is important to bear in mind. 
We have got a, a large range of cases that will fit these cards available on our website. And we have actually now got a section because of the physical size of the cards is so big to guide the end user to cases that will are compatible and will fit the cards comfortably and obviously uh, provide the airflow that the card does need. Also on the website, we've got a section for ATX version 3.0 PSUs, which are the ideal scenario for these. Like I've said, older, quality 1000 watt plus PSUs will work, but they're not the ideal solution. Also, at Overclockers UK, we have a broad range of cards from various vendors that uh, are available within the 4090 section again on our website. This card I tested here is the iChill uh, by uh, Inner 3D, and of course they will be available at launch if you want this exact card. Now we have tested several of these cards between myself and a couple of the other R&D guys, and we across the board we've seen very similar results. So if you want similar results to us, I would suggest that this is the card to go for. So now let's go through a bit of testing methodology of how I tested these cards. Basically, I tested uh, the 4090i chill here uh, versus the MSI 3090 trio versus the 3080ti Strix in a variety of gaming and professional benchmarks. I did that on a flat Windows 11 install with all the latest updates and the latest NVIDIA driver that they provided to me for this specific card. And also, that same driver was used across the other cards as well, just for to make sure actually that there's no driver-induced performance improvements. The driver was just inst installed at stock, uh, and I didn't make any performance adjustments within the driver itself. The system I used for testing uh, was the currently the best uh, gaming CPU uh, and system available. It was an AMD uh, 7950X with PBO tuning, so the boost was up to around 6 gigahertz. Uh, I used that on an AIO 240 cooler with 32 gig of uh, DDR5, 6000 megahertz uh, Corsair XPO. So now let's discuss at the temperatures of these cards under load. To determine temperature, I used GPU Z with maximum core and maximum hotspot temperature and the same within MSI Afterburner. Afterburner is currently working completely fine for the 4090 and adjusting clocks, just as a side heading if you do want to try a bit of overclocking. So what we noticed in terms of temperature was after running the entire benchmarking suite, including some very heavy rendering stuff that was basically only done on the GPU, we saw that the 4090 with this absolutely superb large cooler was topping out at between seven and 10 degrees less maximum core temperature than the 3090 or the 3080 Ti Strix. And that the hotspot on this 4090 was never getting above 85 degrees. And we never saw any type of thermal throttling with the fans running at a very low speed and actually not really audible at all, even on a test bench, which is absolutely great. And this cooling performance obviously has, has been really translated by having such a large cooler. And I must say, once you get a water block on this card, if you do choose to water block it, the PCB is only very small. If we look here from the side, we can see the PCB length is only here to here, uh, compared to the MSI 3090, which the PCB length is here to here. So you could really make the card much, much smaller uh, if you do decide to water block the card. And I believe that we'll, there will be more performance headroom for you there as well but the air cooler is more than adequate. And in fact, in my testing, is better than the 3080 Ti Strix or the 3090 MSI here at maintaining really good temperatures throughout the full range of benchmarks. So firstly, let's quickly discuss about professional benchmarks and why I like these professional benchmarks. Basically, all gaming type or real world benchmarks in the gaming world involve uh, not only a GPU bottleneck, but a CPU bottleneck, no matter what you do. And sometimes even a memory bottleneck, if I'm completely honest. Whereas the professional benchmark can really load up the GPU to its maximum level all the time, so you can really see what the architecture is capable of if you're running all the CUDA cores and everything else maxed out. And what I found with the professional benchmarks that I ran, which were Luxmark, rendering benchmark and a blender benchmark that we made in-house here uh, to render a whole scene that takes normally over an hour on say a 16 core uh, CPU, even the top 16 core CPU, was that the 4090 
was twice as fast as the, either the 3080 Ti or the 3090, and then that benchmark, which I actually thought was absolutely crazy. A full 100% improvement generation on generation was really spectacular. And I really do like those professional benchmarks because they do remove any CPU uh, bottleneck that you do experience. And in games, undoubtedly, there is a CPU bottleneck, especially at lower resolutions. Uh, and even high resolutions, there is gonna be some issue with the CPU. Even with a CPU boosting up to six gigahertz, uh, I definitely saw that in my gaming uh, and 3D benchmarks. So in terms of gaming style benchmarks, I did a full range. We did Superposition, we did Heaven Valley, uh, I did Final Fantasy at 4K. Then I did uh, 3D Mark Port, Port Royal, which heavily relies on ray tracing, and I did that at 1440p and 4K. I did Time Spy at 1440p and Time Spy Extreme at 4K. And then finally, I did Fire Strike, uh, just the vanilla version, which is 1080p. Uh, and again, the results were really, really solid across the board, especially at higher resolutions. What we saw was a 68% increase versus the 3080 Ti stroke 3090, which were very similar on Final Fantasy at 4K. Uh, another highlight was a full 92% improvement at 4K on the Time Spy 4K benchmark. A full 97% improvement on Port Royal at 4K versus the 3080 Ti or the 3090, which were not really statistically any different uh, between the two. And then finally, we saw 57% at 1080p on Fire Strike and around the same, if not slightly less, on Valley. Now, what we see, obviously, exactly as I was mentioning with the professional benchmarks, is the higher the resolution, the more it gives the opportunity for the card to really sing. And what we see where 4K is used and where heavy ray tracing is used, for example, in Port Royal, we're almost getting a full 100% scaling, 97%, uh, which is crazy. We also saw Superposition Benchmark, uh, which is based on the Unreal Engine, where you'd expect extreme performance from this card, even at 4K, which I use 4K optimized settings, 100% scaling which again was fairly mind-blowing because normally these uh, generations, you're looking at around 30 or 35% improvement, certainly first up until the driver's mature and then a little bit more than 50 after a mature driver, even if you, you do it in what call, I call synthetic benchmarks, which is absolutely what I've used here because I wanna see what the graphics card can do and remove as much bottleneck of the system as possible. So now let's uh, look at the overclocking that we did on the card. The latest version of MSI Afterburner, I'm pleased to say, did work whilst overclocking the card and you could set uh, the clock frequency and the memory frequency no problem. The power divider, however, or the power slider, power target, whatever you want to call it, different software calls it different things, on MSI Afterburner is power target. You couldn't move that, so that was stuck at 100%. Uh, and there was other further adjustments that you couldn't ma uh, make right now. But the main two for adjusting clock frequency, obviously, clock itself and memory frequency if you want to increase performance, and those were working perfectly. So this uh, 450 watt PCB uh, iChill card, which is a retail card, uh, one that, that came from our warehouse, uh, and we've duplicated results on, on other iChill cards as well. Uh, the stock uh, boost clock uh, throughout all the benchmarks and even the really tough stuff such as Blender was 2850 uh, megahertz on the GPU core uh, and was uh, 10,502 megahertz on the GDDR6. Uh, when we overclocked, uh, I did obviously a variety of stability uh, testing as well whilst overclocking to make sure that these were gaming stable uh, clocks. Uh, and then once I'd found game instability, then that was when I ran my entire uh, benchmark in uh, Suite. So th th I could actually peak out at higher clocks, but here I'm showing results that are attainable by hopefully uh, eight or nine out of 10 people who are watching the video. Uh, and what I got when I was overclocking was uh, 11,000 uh, 202 megahertz on the memory, which is a nice boost uh, of around 700, just over 700 megahertz. And on the core, I got uh, 3045, so over 3000 megahertz, which is pretty crazy, and has only ever been possible on uh, exotic cooling, such as liquid nitrogen before. 
I did uh, well future mark with scanning. System information and such very, very, very low loading, if you like, see peaks of up to 3300 megahertz. But that's certainly not realistic for when you're running a game or running anything meaningful. Uh, anything meaningful, the graph was uh, topping out at just over 3000 or 3045 megahertz, which is still a mighty overclock. Now, what uh, benefit did we see from overclocking? Well, we certainly didn't see any more power draw, which is great. If, the, if you can get better clocks uh, without drawing any more power from the wall, that's great. And what we saw was uh, one to 2% in most uh, gaming scenarios, uh, similar, slightly, similar or slightly more in your professional benchmarks, such as your Luxmark or your Blender. Uh, the best thing we saw improvement on actually was the Unreal Engine uh, base superposition benchmark where we saw 5.7% increase uh, and obviously I did just mention Blender but that was really solid at around 3% but most you got from your uh, overclocking in general was 1.2 to 2.5% improvement so if you are considering one of these cards do remember check out our website to make sure your case is compatible we've got a whole section on there as well as having uh, a decent size case, of course, you will need airflow as well. So I do suggest that you do install extra fans in the front and the back to ensure good flow through the case. That will translate into raw performance for your GPU and keep it nice and cool. Also, the other thing to bear in mind is PSU. Like I said, we tested with a minimum of 1000 watts of the old ATX version 2.0 of quality PSU. Uh, so a reasonably high rating, at least gold or above of a well-known manufacturer such as C-Sonic, Be Quiet, Asus, uh, you know, a well-known uh, brand that we sell many of on our website. For that, you'll need three or four uh, PCI Express connector adapter, which you can see, uh, like I said, just uh, here on the card here. If you get a full ATX version 3.0 PSU, again, we have a section on our website. Those will work, just plug in straight in. You will not need the adapter, but again, I would make sure you get a minimum of 1,000 watts, ideally 1,200 watts, uh, to make sure everything is gonna work seamlessly. Finally, and again, just remind you, we have got a full range of these cards uh, available on our website for launch. So take your pick, whichever one fits in with your, maybe your motherboard, etc. And I can really vouch for this uh, iChill version by NO3D. We've tested several, all worked great all overclocked reasonably well, all gave consistent results. So if you want to match my results, go with that card. Finally, of course, this is the greatest and latest and best and stupendous and amazing graphics card ever. So of course, it's gonna go in the greatest, most amazing, crazy, best, stupendous range of PCs, which are of course the eight pack PCs. So as soon as water blocks become available, hurry up vendors, these will be integrated into the eight pack range. And the full range, of course, as soon as they're upgraded, will be on our website. So check that out. Right, finally, as always, do not subscribe to our channel. Don't like the video. And watch me again next time.